And this is what this topic is about. It's creating your own off-season coaching development plan. So that like said, I've never presented on this entirely to, and it really didn't even share this with anyone. And I think that this is the greatest platform to do it, um, especially now um, where there's more, more clicks than ever for, for coaches to get exposed to and to learn because of this unfortunate pandemic that we're going through. Um, so like I said, it's just, it's just an area that, uh, that I put myself through. And I think it's important that, you know, when you're going through this to kind of, I guess, create your own plan and, and how that caters to you. So I just want to get started here and talk about uh, the, f the four different phases of a season, uh, I guess a year, um, similar to what we have in terms of our four seasons in a year, but from a sport perspective, um, there are four seasons. So if you see the pictures there, you kind of have an understanding to which phase of, you know, which pitcher represents each, each season. So with the way I break it down here, um, there are four seasons. This is not new to anyone. You know, you have your preseason, you have your regular season, you uh, what what I call your championship season, which is your postseason, and then you have your off season. So what's the difference here? Well, the preseason is where you're really planning your season, um, whether it's planning your curriculum to what you're going to teach, um, maybe it's planning um, exhibition tournaments, fundraising, uh, your training camp, uh, strength and conditioning program. Um, you're, you're instilling your, your culture. Um, so that's, that's the preseason part. And there were, there were a lot of great coaches who spoke, spoke already on this platform about what to do on the preseason. I know Coach Gordy uh, was it the other day talking about, you know, what he does in the preseason. And I thought that that was a really good clinic there to share. Um, and then you get into the regular season. As you know, these are games and practices, more practices and maybe modified practices. I know Coach Clark, um, Carly Clark did a, amazing presentation on, on her, her, her uh, planning a uh, practice. And uh, again, that's the regular season. Then you get into the championship season. Again, things change there in terms of practices. Um, some teams make it, some teams don't um, into the post season, uh, but that's another season. So where I'm really going to focus on here is this off season. So I believe that, you know, your off season really begins the next day after you get eliminated or when your season is over. And for me, once that season is done, this is where I start getting to work. Um, one thing is because I'm truly motivated um, right after the season is done um, because the majority of us, and let's be frank, you know, majority of us are not winning that championship at the end of the season. There's only one team that is. And then from there, you know, you're extremely motivated to, to win that championship. And if you won that championship, then you're extremely motivated to defend that championship. So I think the next day, for, for me, I get right to work. Uh, I'm not one of those guys that would take about a week or two off. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I just find that when wild things are still fresh in my mind, uh, I look to put things pen to paper and start uh, getting to work. So um, that's where I really believe that the next day you start really planning for your next season. Um, so off season, obviously that this is referred to many, um, with this term and the off season is really different months for many teams. Um, for us, it's the spring and summer for the majority. It's the spring and summer for some of you, it may be the winter months. Um, it may be the fall months. So I just think it's important that you, you kind of know your season calendar as I'm going through this presentation. But, uh, to be frank, I, I've never been a big fan of the work off season, um, because um, to me, again, I don't take it off. So I really call this for me the improvement season. And now with the improvement season, uh, I think it's very important that for us to realize as coaches that when we built our improvement season plan for our student athletes, uh, we put a lot of onus on them to say, this is what you've got to do to get better. Um, here are the tools for you to do it. Um, here's the time to do it. This is how you do it. This is why you do it. Um, you know, if you want to come back to this program, you know, you need to improve this. If you want to, you know, sustain your role, you need to do this. If you want to get better, this is what you need to do. Um, you know, as coaches, we, we do that a lot. But for me, I think it's very important as well that we improve as coaches. 
Uh, I always like going into my training environment um, during the improvement season, beginning of the preseason uh, with my student athletes. And they have to have a sense of, you know, coach is better. Coach is a lot better. Um, you know, we're, you could tell what the confidence, you could tell what we're doing on the floor. Uh, things are much smoother. Uh, coach probably knows exactly what he wants and how he wants it done or he or she wants it done. And then your players sh should respond to that. Um, especially if they know they've, they've done the work. And if you haven't done the work um, and they haven't done the work, well, you know, it's kind of hard to get more out of your players if they know that you haven't done the work to get better. You know, we, you know, it's, we want a lot from our players to be better, um, to give us their all. And, you know, if we don't, have, let's be frank, we, we don't have a lot of trust in our players if we know they haven't done the work. So what makes them think that, you know, they could trust us if we haven't done the work? Um, so I think there's got to be that instant connection of, okay, he's getting better, she or, she or she's getting better cause, because coach is better, and now it's, it's just an improvement environment. So I, I just, that's why I changed the word to improvement season. All my student athletes uh, that, that I've coached um, past and, and present, they understand what, what, why I change it and what, what this means. So I, I really believe, again, you're, if you want your players to get better, part of it is that, you, that you're getting better. And here's a little quote, if you always do what you've always done, you soon get less than you ever got. So moving on, I think that, you know, as, as, I'm, as I'm going through this, um, it, it's very important, and Coach said it, Coach Sullivan said about being a lifelong learner, is getting rid of any beliefs that your mind is fixed. I think if you come with the approach that this is the way I've always done things and I'm never going to change, well, I, I don't know how much success you're going to have in terms of connecting with your players or your players respecting you or, or playing hard for you um, if, if that's the way you've done things. And there, there's a way of always doing things and there's a way of stop doing things. Um, so I think there's always room, room for improvement. I will, I've always said the biggest room in this world is a room for improvement. And that goes on to the next point that our brain is, is, is plastic. It can be molded. You know, it's, it, it can be expanded. Um, it's, it's for us to, to learn new things. Like I can learn from anyone. My son's five years old and I learn a lot from him every single day. Um, so there's always opportunities to learn something new and to really expand our knowledge. Failure is not permanent. And like I said, we usually end in the season. You know, the majority of teams are going to end the season, probably not making the playoffs or losing that last game or having a heartbreaker. And it, it hurts. You know, it, it hurts a lot. And, you know, you may say that it was a failed season or I'm a failure. Or, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't get the gold and, and we lost. Um, but that's not permanent. I think it's, you know, you always have another season to prepare for. Like I said, I, I do it the next day because I'm extremely motivated and uh, things are still fresh and I want to get after it again. And that just goes with just having that growth mindset um, and, you know, constantly looking to get better. And, again, we, we put a lot of onus on, on our student athletes and we should be really doing that ourselves. Um, and this is a hashtag that, that I use a lot when I, when I tweet things out. Um, again, it's just about being a lifelong learner. So I think as I'm going through this presentation, coaches, um, it's important um, that you use what is relevant to you. And I think it's not just my presentation. I do this a lot when I'm watching all the other presentations on this platform and different platforms. It's, you know, writing down things that, that, uh, that that's relevant to you. I'll write down everything and you kind of choose what's relevant to you right now. Um, like I said, be cautious of your season calendar. Everyone's season calendar is different. Uh, our off season, my improvement season is spring and summer months, whereas yours could be a lot different because I know there's club going on, there's AAU going on uh, during this time if there wasn't a pandemic. Um, so just be cautious of your season calendar because maybe your improvement season might be longer, uh, maybe it might be shorter. Park the information. So what I mean by parking the information, uh, that means that you know, it's what's not relevant. You put it aside and you kind of come back to it um, later on when it is relevant. And I find myself doing that a lot. You know, I, I, I'm proud of myself in organization. So when I, when I go through my notes that I've taken in the past, I always take about a week during the improvement season to kind of read all my coaching notes that since I started coaching and kind of look through that saying, is there anything that I could take that, that I haven't used that I may may have learned in the past or maybe you know wrote down and it wasn't for me at that time because it wasn't relevant and that's what i mean by parking the information and i said okay now it's relevant now or i get that now or that's a different perspective or that's a way of doing things or that's how i do it 
um, I'm going to keep doing it. Um, so I think going back to that information, um, especially after this, after this platform is, is, is finished, it's going through all the notes and using what's relevant and parking the rest. And from there, design your own plan. So I'm about to get into my planning details. So I plan my developmental uh, plan for, for an improvement season. So I think it's important that you design your own plan. So here, here are the things that I'm going to go through. Um, so these are five, five steps I put myself through. First one is self-evaluation and, and reflection. The second one is seek, seek feedback. Third one is start planning. Next one, start organizing, and then finally put into action. All right, so the evaluation phase or the self-reflection phase, and again, this is something that I do right when the season is over. Uh, I, you know, I, I sit there, I collect my thoughts. I, I write things a lot. If I'm on my phone, I'm typing things a lot. Whatever comes to mind, there's really no limit. And what I'm really looking to evaluate, and this is in no particular order, the first thing I want to evaluate is the style of play. You know, was the style of play used this season? Was that something that, that was benefit to us? Did it really, you know, use our strengths of our roster? And I just took this job about a year ago. And, you know, this is something that I evaluated a lot after our first season here at Windsor was a, was a style of play. And, you know, did we, did we play with the right style of play? What did I like? What did I dislike? Um, and the things that I like and dislike, what did I like? Why did I like it? You know, at what point of the season um, was, when it was good or wasn't, wasn't good and, and, and why and how? How were those things good and how were those things bad? So I think you're always evaluating, evaluating your style of play and, and you know, things that we look at there. You know, I look at analytics to help my style of play. Um, you know, we, I look at uh, our, our DNA and how we play on both ends of the floor. I look at our, our KPIs, which are key performance indicators to, to let me know what our style of play is. And of course, I look at statistics. And the one thing that I, that I do a lot is I watch film. I watch a lot of film as hard as it is. I watch our last game and the games before that. And, you know, it's hard, you know, because, you know, that last game you lost and you want to move on, but it's something that, that you have to watch. So I watch a lot of our games and, you know, Synergy, we have access to Synergy and I watch a lot of clips. I watch games for particular possessions. Um, Synergy has become my Netflix during this time. So I've been watching a lot of film daily just to evaluate our style of plays. The next thing that I will look at is our, our VVS and our culture. Um, so VVS stands for vision, values, and standards. So vision, values, and standards. Uh, so that's our culture. And I'm really evaluating, you know, how did I instill our culture here in my first year at Windsor? Um, you know, how do, how do we go about that every single day? Was that exemplified in, in our training environment? Did that show in our competitive environment? Did it show when we were off the floor as a unit and as individuals? Um, so things that I'd love to evaluate in, in, in my first year here. Next thing is about goals. So, you know, we, we are a goal-oriented uh, program. I know a lot, of, a lot of coaches don't use goals. They, they, they you know, to talk about the, pro, about the process. And we still embrace the process every single day within those goals. And these are goals that, you know, we have. And one of the goals that we have, our first and foremost goal, is our academic goal. So what do we want our grade point average to be collectively as a team uh, for each semester and then finally at the end of the, end of the year? Uh, another goal that we have is our community goal. So, you know, what do we want to do in our community? And, and this is all driven by my student athletes. It's not driven by the coaches. Um, so we, we kind of set the platform for them and, and they build it and they, they tell us and we ride with them. So we make it visible to them exactly what goals they have for, the, for them for, as a team academically and in the community. And finally, it's, it's a season. So where they want to be come before exam break, before the, before the holidays, and where they want to be at the end of the season. So these are goals I look to evaluate. And again, these are, some, these are goals that are driven by the players, not by, my, not by myself or my staff. Next one I evaluate is my team management. So my leadership, you know, how did I handle the team? Um, how did I handle the program? How did I handle my staff, um, our supporters, friends of the program, alumni? Um, so that's what I'm looking at. You know, I always said to, to, to my colleagues, my close friends, if you really want to know if you're a good coach, ask your worst player. And, you know, that, that could tell you a lot. So how did I manage my team 
um, one through 16, as well as my assistant coaches to my support staff. Um, I, I evaluate that a lot because that's important to me, connecting with those individuals. And, you know, they're working uh, their butts off for themselves, obviously for the program and for me as, a, as their head coach. Um, so I'm really looking at that and evaluating myself there. Next is my mental health. As, as uh, coaches know that the season is draining. Huh. It's physically draining, but it's more emotionally draining, uh, mentally draining. Um, you know, for us in, in, in the youth sports and the OUA, we play every single week, and there's, we have two games every single week. Sometimes we play Friday, Saturday, or we play Wednesday, Saturday. And every week is like an emotional roller coaster. You know, you could go 0 and 2, and that Sunday leading up to that Monday is just like, all right, let's, let's find a way. And you may split that Sunday, and going to that Sunday, you're like, all right, let's find a way. And you go 2-0, and oh, and you're feeling great, but you're like, all right, let's find a way. Let's find a way to keep it going. And so that's just me, you know, evaluating how, how did I take care of myself and my nutrition. Um, one thing I started to, that I have to start doing that I, I recognize is, is, is exercising more. And one of my assistant coaches, Igor, he always gets on me about that because he's a fitness instructor. But, you know, it's, it's those things that I have to evaluate. You know, i got to be in the right frame of mind, um, especially if I expect it from members of my program. Uh, so that's something that I evaluate. The next thing is my coaching philosophy. So, you know, I, um, I've, been, I've been a head coach at this level for six years now, but I've been coaching for 14 years in total, going to my 15th year. Um, and, you know, I, my coaching philosophy changed over the years. And I kind of have a good sense of who I am as, as, a, as a coach and, and, and who I am as a person to the members of my program, especially my student athletes. Um, so it's something that, you know, I go back to. Um, and your coaching philosophy, and there's been a lot of great talks so far on this platform about, you know, your coaching philosophy and, you know, how does that evolve? Um, how does that change over time and kind of, you know, who you are? Um, but I still, you know, I go back to my coaching philosophy. I have, I, have, I have it written down and I look at that, you know, how, how I value my team, um, how I value myself as a coach and as a leader, and, you know, how I value academics and, what side, and how I value each side on the floor and, and all that stuff. So this is where I really evaluate in these areas. And again, it's no in particular order, but this is where I put myself through. And, and this timeline here really has no limit. You know, it's, it, it, could, it could take me, you know, days to weeks to, 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 to me evaluating these areas. The next, the next step I want to go to, um, so sorry, I'm going back here to, so this, this is the, our DNA. So the style of play, so as you see here, we have our defensive DNA, our offensive DNA. So this is something that when teams see us play, they should know, okay, this is what their, their clear objectives are on both ends of the floor. So when I look at, you know, film and I watch, again, I talked to you about watching film. I look at, you know, how do we protect the paint? Um, you know, how do, we, how do we do that? We call it protect elbows, blocks, and nail. Uh, how do we do it in terms of our defensive rebound? Was there any, how did we complete plays? Or did we give up a lot, a lot of offensive rebounds? And, you know, frankly, we did this year, so that's, that's an area that we that I have to look at. Ball pressure, you know, beginning of the year, I think we were third in our in our conference. I think we finished within the top seven, and and how we force turnovers. Um, so ball pressure is something that we still have to be good at. Uh, contesting all shots, something that we chart as well. Uh, we we never want anyone to open the window comfortably. You know, we want to pressure them and uh, force them the type of shots to take. Of course, deflections just goes with ball pressure and completing plays and contesting shots and how we protect that with nails and block. So it's just, you know, how, how active are we? Uh, I always say pressure with your feet, uh, deflect with your hands. It's not, you know, pressure with your hands, uh, deflect with your feet, because if you do that, well, it's a kickball and another part, and it's a foul. So it's really pressure with your feet, deflecting with your hands, and that's what we preach, and that's how, that's how we work out from a technical standpoint with a one-on-one -on -one defense. Offensively, pace. Pace is important. You know, we, our rule is three and three, eight and five, and primary within five. So how do we get that within the shot clock? Early spacing and re-spacing, uh, you know, how, how we penetrate, how we re-space, and how we early space be, as we get into transition, um, both on the make and miss. Ball movement, are we sharing the rock and how we're doing that? How many hockey assists are we having? Um, open shots, that leads kind of to a lot there. Uh, the first, especially the first three with pace early spacing with pace and space and of course ball movement and of course port final advantages you probably heard that a lot from when, when coaches talk about the technical and strategic part of the game um, especially offensively it's just about 0.5 advantages 
five key, key winning areas. This is something that I have that, that I do at halftime. Um, so something I've done in the last couple of seasons, and it's been pretty true to its point that, uh, you know, at halftime, we look at okay, who's winning each category. And let's say we're winning three out of five. Well, we have a 60% 60 chance of winning this game if we continue to do those categories, uh, to win those categories. I think there was only once that, that we won, that, that I won a game when we, we actually won with 40% chance coming into the second half. Um, so these are, those are the areas that, you know, I look at with the stat sheet and say, okay, where are we? That doesn't mean that I get comfortable if we're at a 60 or 80 or 100. You know, obviously there's still tactics and game adjustments to be involved in. You know, you could easily lose a game in the second half of the, second half of the season, you know, even though you're winning the majority of the categories by failing to make any, any adjustments or the right adjustments for your team to win. Um, so that's kind of what I look like and look at to help evaluate a style of play. The next I talk about the, KP, the, the KPI, the key performance indicator. So here are seven things that I found that would impact outcome. So effective field goal percentage, assisted field goal percentage, turnover to possession, defensive rebounding rate. So, you know, where are we in terms of our conference of, of, of rebounding? You know, what are we a plus five or a plus three or are we in the negative? Uh, defensive rating, so where, where are we, you know, how many points are we allowing per possession? Scoring gap, are we in the plus? And we're so, by, by how much? And, you know, that, that kind of tells us, you know, if we're only winning games by plus one or plus two, then, you know, that's going to put a lot of point of emphasis in special situations. If, you're, if we're winning games, but then we're losing a lot of games and we're in the negative, well, we've got to find ways to shrink that gap and get into the even or get, into the, get to the plus side. And again, it's probably special situations. Uh, double digit scores, you know, we were, we were, I think we had four guys in double digits or three guys in double digits. And I think the magic number to have there is three or four. Um, I've seen one team that had um, only one guy in double digit score because he was averaging about 26, but the rest were like eight or nine or, you know, they were close to that. They had like four or five guys close to double digits. So, so um, double digit scores is something that, you know, that, that we want to look at, especially if you want to score at a higher rate. And I think we average about 88 points per game this year. Um, so those are the seven KPIs that I look at. And of course here, uh, this is kind of, I got this from uh, Barry Hayes. Thank you, Barry Hayes. Um, and uh, he looked at, you know, the, the most improved teams um, from last season, um, two seasons ago to this past season. And we were second best improved team in the country. Um, in my first year, and now these, these, when you look at that, I say, well, that's, that's pretty damn good, but yes and no. It looks good if you don't know what you're looking at. Um, you know, for, for, for me, um, it looks, when you look at the full net difference, it looks good because we were second, but if you look at our offensive rating, we, we weren't very good. You know, we're, we're at 99, and you look at the teams that, that were there, you know, that's something that I have to look at. Say, okay, we really need to improve our offense here because we're not scoring enough for possession here, and when we got to get at the height that high rating. Defensively, yeah, you know, it looks good, but compared to the rest, it's not very good. So, you know, it's, you know, this, this whole thing about us being second is kind of screwed because, you know, we have to be better offensively and defensively. And so that kind of gives me an, a good outlook in terms of style of play to what exactly I got to look at, looking at the film, look at the statistics, looking at our DNA, the KPIs, and that kind of gives me a clear indication to and in what areas on the floor we need to improve. When I talk about the vision, the values, and the standards, so something that I evaluate, uh, this is our vision for our program. We want to be recognized as one of the top basketball programs in the country, consistently ranked in the top 10 and, and contending for provincial and national championships. So that's our vision. Obviously, it's something hard that you, you, you won't accomplish in your first year, but, you know, it gives your student athletes and your supporters and even yourself, this is where we're going. This is, and this is, we're going to find out things and how we're going to get there and, and what things we're going to do. Uh, so I think it's important that we have that, this vision. Um, this is this is this is brought forward early in the year, and you know it's 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 reviewed every single year. But I think I could have done a better job in making this more visible to my student athletes, uh, especially in the team room. I don't think we had this posted in the team room. That's something that I should have done. Um, but it's something that we talk about a lot. But you know, talking and having it having it visible, um, it's it, it's it's totally different. Um, both impactful, but I think when it's more visible, it has has a greater impact, especially when when you're saying it. Our mission statement. So who are we as a program? Who are we as a coaching staff? What exactly are you going to get from our program? Um, so we're committed to champion a culture of excellence through the development of the student athlete as a person, student athlete. So every person, everyone knows whether it's a, 
our superior student athletes, their parents, our recruits. Um, they know this is what they're getting when they come to our program. We're, getting, we're, we're building, we're trying to champion a culture of excellence, and this is through the development of, through you, you know, through you as a student athlete. And in that, it's going to be as a person, student, and athlete in that order. And how we do those things, you know, we, we talk about, and some of these are, are, are some of these are our core values. You know, we talk about teaching them life skills of accountability and honesty, respect, humility, leadership, and being selfless. So, you know, we, we talk about these things a lot. We give them exercises. Sometimes they just come about and, you know, we, we mention them. It's a good teaching moment. Some of them display it and, and we recognize that we praise the behavior that we want. Um, so, you know, and, and the behavior that we don't, we make it very clear. We nip it in the butt right away. Um, so the, everyone knows that, you know, that they're here as a person um, and we're here to develop them as people. And then they were people, they're not an X, they're not an O. So how we're, these, are, these are ways that we do that as a program. Now as a student, I'm very involved with my student athletes, academics, very involved. Um, so I meet with them weekly to, to go over their academics. I'm almost like their academic advisor because I'm, I'm tracking, you know, I know exactly what, what class they're in and where they're in. And sometimes I surprise my student athletes when I'm in their class. And when, I, when they walk in, I said, I'm saving your seat because our, one of our standards is that you guys sit in the first three rows of, of every class. So I meet with them weekly and we go over um, their assignments. I have a section in my practice plan where I actually put what's due that week for, for those student athletes if they have anything due, anything from a mini assignment to a test to, to anything. Um, it's something that I give them reminders of. And I make it very loud so everyone knows that, hey, that person has something due. Um, so they can hold them accountable as well. So they're in a kind of extension of me in that, in that aspect. Um, you know, we have, we have access to tutoring, mentorship, advising, and of course, wellness. And, and it's something that, uh, you know, we, we take very seriously here. Now, as an athlete, how do, we, how do we help them develop as an athlete? Well, we do specialization development, especially at this phase, at this level. Uh, mental training, fitness training, we, we enhance their competitiveness. And of course, they give them insight to nutrition, but also how we model that through as well in terms of, uh, you know, the food that we order for them when we're at home especially when we're away for, for away games. So kind of that's our pyramid. Again, this is our mission statement too. This is who we are. We're championing that culture of excellence through the development of you. And in, in that order, it's going to be as a person, student, and as an athlete. So again, this is the things that I evaluate uh, with my program. How am I doing this? And did, did I do it well? And of course, this builds excellence. So now, after I go through my evaluation of self-reflection, I think it's important that I get feedback. You know, I just don't tell my thing, myself what I want to hear um, because I want to hear from other people. And I think this takes a lot um, to do. I mean, you know, I think you got to be thick skinned and to hear some things that you maybe don't want to hear. And I think that's, that's part of it. And we expect it from our student athletes. You know, if they want to hear the honest truth, then you're going to get the honest truth. And I think we got to do the same thing. We got to be willing to, to, to take it as well. Uh, so who I get feed, feedback from is my team. And this is something I do throughout the season, not just at the end of the season. Uh, we go and, uh, I, again, my weekly meetings are good opportunities to get that feedback, um, whether it's about their role, about the program, um, how things are going in practice. I, I, I welcome that feedback, and I, I take everything with a grain of salt, obviously, you know, at the end of the day, I'm making that, that, that final decision. Uh, but I want to hear from my team, and that includes, you know, my assistant coaches, my support staff, about their role and how they're feeling involved and ways they could be involved. And the best question I always ask my athletes are is, what what do you believe that you could bring to this program, um, especially before we get into roles? Um, so it's kind of hearing their perspective because, you know, in their improvement season, they put in a lot of work to improve and you got to give them that benefit. So coming into a new season, there's something that they want more. And I think instead of pigeonholing them in that same role they had last year, just asking them, you know, what do you, what do you feel you could bring to the team this year? What role do you see for yourself? So I get this feedback. Um, constantly, um, mid-season, and some of the questions I ask them, um, especially the, our leadership group, is what are some of the things you want me to stop doing? What are some of the things you want me to continue doing? And what are some of the things you want me to start doing? And I get that feedback throughout. And again, I, I met with all my student athletes uh, at the end of the season, and I'm still asking them that question because I'm keeping, keeping in contact with them weekly. Another area that I get to, and some of you may be, you know, with this area, maybe in club, maybe so in high school, it's good to get feedback from your parents. Um, I have no problem talking with any of my student athletes 
parents. They're a part of our program. They're a part of our family. I rely on them to help me nurture their son because um, they know their son better than, than me, and I'm learning more about them. Um, I always have conversation with the parents. So it's not saying I'm calling parents at the end of the season asking for their feedback. That's something that I'm not doing. I want to be straight with that. Uh, but, you know, parents know that they, they could call me and uh, we talk. So, you know, if there's any feedback, sometimes I get feedback from the parents throughout the season. Um, and, again, I take it with a grain of salt, but it's something that I welcome. Opposing coaches, this is something that I've, that I've done since I was a head coach. I would call coaches in my conference and ask them, you know, what, what do you think about my team? How did you prepare for us? Um, you know, what, what do you think about, uh, you know, you played my team in the last couple of years or, you know, we play you twice a year. What do you think? You know, and hopefully they give me their honest truth because if they ask me, I would give them my honest truth. And, you know, for me, it's just finding ways to get better. And hopefully they realize that. And I'll be happy to share with them how they could get better. I think this is a coaching community where we all want, want each other to strive and, and be the best we could be. And, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for coaches to help me. So, you know, I, that's something that I've learned over the years is call opposing coaches. And some coaches call me as well. And, you know, we, we break down film together. And I'm fortunate for, for, for some of the, the coaches that helped me, helped me in this league, continue to help me. Um, so that's something that I challenge you coaches to do is, you know, maybe it's your rival coach. And, you know, it's a big game and, you know, it's always been a rival between high schools and clubs and give them a call and, and ask them those questions. Administration. So obviously I do, I go through evaluation at the end of the year with my administration, uh, especially my first year here, I was seeking a lot of feedback to ensure that I was doing things to their expectations and their standards um, and getting to understand how they operate here. So a lot of feedback from my administration. And a big one, my wife. You know, I'm gone um, majority of the year. Um, this pandemic has actually given me an opportunity to spend more time with my kids and my wife. And, you know, I'm grateful for, for, for that aspect of it, despite, you know, the unfortunate events. Um, but, you know, something that I talk to my wife constantly about, you know, how am I doing, keeping that balance. Um, I got young kids and I want I want to make every every uh, swimming swimming class and soccer practice and basketball practice and everything there. I want to ensure that I do that. Um, so how how did I do that? How did I manage that? especially when I'm away, especially I'm going to be gone for a long time, and especially how to handle that relationship. And my wife means everything to me. Um, so, you know, she's the best recruit that, 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 that I got. Um, so I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're on the same page and that I'm getting her feedback on how I manage that as, as, a, as a father, husband, and as a coach. So here are some of the feedbacks that I go through now. So once I get that feedback, you know, one thing that, we, that I recognize was patient space. So, you know, how did, how did we space and drill penetration? You know, I didn't feel that, you know, we, were, we moved well at times. Um, sometimes we didn't move at all. So, you know, how, we had to get better in drilling that. And again, this is the first year of the system for these guys. Uh, so I recognize that a little bit, but I still don't take it as a whole reason to why we can't get better and why we should have not been better. Uh, how, we spaced in, how was our spacing in post entries and, of course, in transition? Uh, versus matchups. So, you know, we target matchups in our scouting report and against our opponents. So, you know, how do we attack the best matchup? So VM is best matchup. PBM is perimeter best matchup. So someone we're attacking from the perimeter. Uh, best matchup is usually someone we're attacking from the post. So how do we do those things in our ball screen and, and screen actions and within our, those concepts? Um, so how do we work on, how do we work on those in practices? And a lot of film that I watch too is in, is in our practice that we videotape all our practices. Um, quick hitters, you know, what are some of the quick hitters that we use and was that effective um, to get into those actions to attack those matchups? Uh, mismatches, we call it ox. Uh, so when, when you hear my team yell ox, 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 it means that there's a mismatch. And there's usually two mismatches, um, our post against a little and our little against a post. Um, so, you know, how do we work on those? Because you know, we see a lot of switches, um, whether it's off ball or on ball. And how do we attack those mismatches in those ox situations? Uh, did we create good double gaps off mismatch? And, you know, again, it's maybe you have to develop more of the skills. We definitely have to develop more of the, of the skills of our players to do that. Um, so that's kind of the three areas that I identified um, were, and there's others, but these, these are the main three that I thought that we could have been better in. Defensively, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, our push points, and again, again, it goes to our ball pressure and off-ball pressure from deflections and completion. Um, so how did we do those things? Did we, did, you know, evaluate how we taught those things? And um, watching film, and I thought, you know, we could have done a lot better on a one-on-one -on -one defense. I think mean, team defense starts with one-on-one. -on -one. You've got to guard your yard. Um, and, you know, we, we have push points, we, we, we protect doubles. 
elbows, blocks, and nails. So, you know, how do we do those things? First three stars, so I call it three stars. These are the guys that we targeted as their main guys on the, on the opposition. So someone who's their leading scorer, maybe the best playmaker, the best shooter, best post player. Um, so how do, you know, how do we do with those tactics? And these are tactics that we drill uh, every single day. And, uh, you know, when it's, uh, whether it's block practices or random practices, but, you know, we do very unique things in our practices against those three stars. So, you know, KYP means know your personnel and KTP means uh, know the plan. So, you know, once you know your personnel, you got to know the plan. Everyone needs to know, know the plan. Uh, how do we, did we blow up action? Uh, usually before that, when their best players, they get into some kind of action. Uh, so did we blow that up to, to eat some time on the clock and not allow them to catch it in their hot spot? Pace changers. So we, we ran a little full court, full court pressure, something that one of my, two of my assistants installed this year. And I'm very fortunate that they, that they, that they are masters in that. And it really changed the game for us. So we want to look at continue doing those doing that tactic switches you know we call it whites when we switch everything and we switch that action so how do we switch it how we how do we rotate on the triangle on the back side uh how do we come late if we couldn't rotate early um so things like that running jump something that i want to add and you know coaches my staff and i talked about this i think we try to implement it early but not 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 enough uh, so something we want to add and, and look to get better in so again pace changers all right, so once I get through my evaluation, let me make sure I go for time here. Uh, evaluation and planning, I kind of say, okay, how am I going to plan this from what, I, from, the, from what I evaluated in those areas, the feedback that I got? And what I really do is I create mini projects for myself. You know? So again, a mini project could be fundraising, it could be leadership, it could be team management, um, it could be culture. Um, so these are just, again, I'm just picking offense and defense, you know? Um, so, What's that mini project? Where am I getting these resources for me to get better? And again, this platform here, like I said, this whole pandemic has given us more access to clinics than we ever imagined, because usually we have to fly around the world and pay a lot of money to do this. So uh, thank you, Golden Ticket and Basketball Immersion. Um, so it's, it's just finding those resources, mentors, again, me calling other coaches and trying to get those feedback and putting that all together, um, taking what's relevant, parking it, and then from there, um, one thing I want to keep doing is keep coaching. I've been very fortunate and I'm blessed to have the honor to you know, be the head coach of a provincial team in the past and now represent our country. And I think anytime you get to represent your country, it's always an honor. And that's where a lot of my professional development comes from because I like to keep involved in coaching. I think I, and I know it's hard. We can't do it now, but I encourage you to do it, whether it's in summer camps. I learned a lot in summer camps, especially how to teach because there's a variety of levels and ages. Um, volunteering or being part of your provincial or national team and getting in part of that or, or as coach, maybe you're assistant coach of another team that you just want to learn from that coach and, and, and help those student athletes there in that area, in that club or AAU program or high school, wherever the case may be. Um, so I think it's important that you got to keep coaching. You know, when you go into your improvement season, you want to put some of this stuff into action and you want to learn. And I think you got to be learned. You got to learn by doing and getting involved. So this is how I kind of plan it. You know, I got my mini projects. I get those resources and I try to keep coaching to learn new things and also put those things in action. So if you have an opportunity to do that, um, where you could, you know, get into a run of practice and start running some of those concepts or principles that you, that you learned that you want to put into maybe the, the main team that you're a head coach of. Um, I think that's important too, is to, again, is to keep coaching. Endurance. I think this is important. When we talk about grit, we talk about people that are grit, they have a high level of endurance to their motivation. Um, to their passion. I challenge this a lot with my team, level endurance. And I challenge you as a coach that when you go to this planning stage, this is where the bulk of the planning comes in. And this is where, frankly, a lot of the majority of my weeks and months are being spent. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of endurance that has to go through this. You can't just do it when you feel like it. Um, you know, again, I'm motivated from, from the previous season. I'm motivated from me, I was the passion of coaching, the student athletes that I'm coaching, the people that are working with me. That, that's that what gives me my passion. So finding endurance to keep doing it, I think that's important because you don't want to start it and not finish it. Organization. So once you go into the evaluation, you get the feedback, you start planning. Now you've got to start organizing. So how is this organized um, once you have, you know, you do your mini projects and you find your resources? So just to give you an example, one thing that I looked at was, okay, was it was our style of play? We, I want to look at some more five-out offense. It's something that we started playing at the end of the season, maybe our last eight games, and I really liked it. Um, it was a personnel that we, that, that we had here. 
uh, that I inherited, but also the person that I, want, that I recruited as well, because I really like what I saw there. Um, so looking at different five out offenses in the early offense there, um, to how can we get into a four out one in afterwards or how we start from a five out. Uh, so I looked at some resources there and I started planning there with my mini projects. Then mini, then pressure defense, I talked about that, more about 1v1 and, you know, goes back to our DNA about deflections and completion. So teaching now, so once I have this style of play, how is this going to be taught? So what's some of our foundation drills? So these are some, maybe they're, they're blocked or random. Um, how are we to get out of, how are we going to teach it, you know, from a whole part, whole standpoint, you know, how are we going to really emphasize some of our concepts offensively on this five out? And how are we to really emphasize more our, our principles defensively on our pressure, our pressure defense? So what are those foundation drills? Start getting to my drill book, my fast draw, putting that together on some of our staple games, some of our competitive games, and some things how we're going to do that, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one to two-on-two -two to three-on-three all the way to five-on-five -five or advantage-disadvantage situations, um, depending on what, what side of the floor we're working on. Um, so how are we going to teach that? And how we're going to teach it now, it's uh, what are those points of emphasis going to be on both ends of the floor? So these are your negotiables and non-negotiables. Um, so, you know, how do you teach that offensively? What are those points of emphasis? And no more than three. I uh, hear a lot of coaches saying that's what we do as well. So here are the three things we're trying to get out of it. Um, these are the things we're not trying to get out of it. Obviously, the one that are not going to emphasize this, um, you know, that go against the concept or principles. But again, what are our points of emphasis? So this is kind of how I organize it. You know, once I have my mini project, I start building my foundation drill book, our staple games, maybe something that we already do that I want to enhance, or we already have it in our drill book or staple games book, and we just want to keep doing it, maybe with a different point of emphasis. And from there, I go back to the evaluation stage. So how do I, how do I evaluate uh, what I'm doing here? Um, and then, of course, that's going to go through film, points of emphasis, and KPIs. All right, so now these are some things that maybe you want to add some additions or adjustments. Like for us, I made some adjustments in our offensive and defensive terminology. There's a terminology that I used in my previous institution, and when I came here to Windsor, I, I noticed that the majority of the guys were saying a different terminology it was the same meaning. So one, one way that I did, instead of getting them to adjust to me, I adjusted to them because all of them were saying it but me. So I'm like, all right, I'm not going to be the bigger guy here. I'm actually going to follow them. And uh, so that worked out well. And that's something that they learned different terminology from me, but also kept the same terminology that they, that, that they used um, with, with the previous coach. Uh, scouting, some adjustments we made there. Of course, leadership. I'm always looking ways to enhance my leadership team management and team culture. I'm going to talk a little bit about the leadership piece uh, as I go along here. I'm not running out of time, so I'm going to try to speak quickly. Now, when you put into action, can you put into action your improvement season? Are these things that you can already do? I talked about, you know, continued coaching um, and improvement season. So some of these things that you plan in your mini project, can you start implementing? Um, I think it's always great if you can implement it in your improvement season and then not wait till your season starts uh, because you could always make adjustments before your season starts. And when your season starts, it's actually better. Season planning, so I talked about that when you're preseason to your to your regular season to your championship season. So start implementing to put into that. And hopefully, like I said, you had an opportunity to do that in your improvement season. Um, it's not what you know, it's what you do that, that makes you better. Uh, this is this is a in our in our player handbook. Um, this is the first page here, and we talked about hills and valleys, um, riding the waves, and you know, this is where we want to go. It's not gonna be easy. And as a coach, it's not gonna be easy. You know, like I said, it takes most emotionally and mentally draining. Uh, sometimes physically, physically draining, um, but I think you got to stay the course, and you know you just got to know where you're going and be confident in yourself. Things to keep in mind: um, consistency. I think it's important that you know you want to build a level of consistency in the in the system that you have. I don't think you want to come every every season and start changing things up because you know your players are, are you you can't build a systematic culture that way on the floor. Yes, you can add things, but you don't want to change things every year. So I think it's important that you build consistency. You want to know your offense inside and out. You, know, you want to get to a point in the game where you, if the opposing coach is going to make this, this adjustment, you know what adjustment they're going to make. So you're going to counter the counter because you've seen all the adjustments that teams have done to you, um, to your system. So you, you're ready to make that, that counter, and you're, you're always ahead of the game. You're playing that chess match, now playing checkers. Um, so knowing your system, building consistency connect to your team. Uh, I say, I, you know, I think it's important that you connect with your team. You just don't disappear in the off in the, in the proven season. You want to connect them and build and build them 
Um, it's all about them getting better, of course, yourself getting better as well. Um, connecting your assistant coaches. My assistant coaches right now have tasks that they're doing. They're watching film with their assigned players every single week. Um, you know, talk about areas that need to improve. We want them to continue doing or some maybe areas that, you know, they have to stop doing. Um, so we connect our team a lot during the spring and summer months. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful that I have some good leadership on this team that, you know, they, they connect without the coach's guidance. Innovative, I think you want to come into the season being innovative, bringing new things to the program. Again, you know, players see that, um, they get excited for it. They, they see that you're really taking the time to really improve and make their season even greater. Uh, be visible and available. This is important. You can't just give your team a plan to improve in the season, then you disappear. Um, you know, if you have training environments and training times to be at, be there. You know, I think you, you've got to be there sweating with them and getting on the court with them. they got to see that you're in it for them. And they got to feel as well that you're getting better. So you want to be visible and be available. This is the character muscle that we worked on. Talk about leadership. So we talk about performance and moral character checklists. So I challenge my, my student athletes to kind of write down or check mark what character muscle they have and why do they have it and what things they do to display that muscle. And we talk about them with them individually, what character mus muscle that they want to have. Uh, to add or strengthen um, how do you do that base so we just talk about this and give them the resources to do those things Again, it's about being building leadership and connecting with your team this is our improvement season objectives for my program so we have seven objectives the first one is player development i think it's first and foremost those are the four pillars there that we want to improve with our with our student athletes on the floor system development and reinforcement so some of the things we do on the floor this is more so from your players within competition so when they're scrimmaging are they holding themselves and their teammates accountable to the DNA and to what the points of emphasis and exactly how, how are we playing on both ends of the floor. Of course, coaching development for myself and my staff, leadership development, some of that has to go with the character muscle. Ownership, we talk about ownership a lot. First three words there, O-W-N, we talk about, okay, what now? Okay, what next? Um, don't put the blame on others, take ownership for it. What are you gonna do now? What are you gonna do next? Uh, team cohesion, you know, usually have the team over for barbecues and we do different things. Um, sometimes it's player-led, sometimes it's coaching-led, so it's a good time to build your team. And of course, team culture. We're trying to invest into a, building a commitment culture here uh, from fulfilling our trademark behaviors, which is our values. So these are seven ways that we'll to improve um, us as a program individually um, heading into that preseason, and we start the phases all over again. Um, so I kind of rest that last part, trying to leave part, parts for questions. Um, if there's any questions or comments um, or anything at all, feel free to uh, email me. My social media there, there as well. Uh, hopefully you were able to hear me. I try to speak as loudly as I can. Um, hopefully this was helpful for, helpful for you. I apologize how to go through the last couple of slides really quickly, but I'd be happy to share um, any more insights um, or feedback that you guys had. Um, Cause again, I was rushing through it.